Do yourself a favor and Google our base Waves Audio. Depending on where you live and what you've searched before, you might see a couple of search terms come up that are not, you know, just the product display page and some ads, but forums and people saying, I need to get rid of all my Waves plug and I hate their subscription update plan, but is there anything that's a good substitute for our base? Can I get like an our base clone, our base, our base? And I think this speaks to this tool's essential nature for a lot of mix engineers and maybe sound designers and maybe mastering engineers who have come to rely on this very old plugin. And that's why I think it's a great candidate to do a video in this series that we do on Manchester Music, why is everyone in love or obsessed with X plugins? So today, Renaissance bass from Waves Audio. Now, I've done the best I could to dig into the documentation and understand exactly at a technical level what is going on with this tool. Unfortunately, a lot of the mechanics are patented. So the best you can do is kind of read you know, the manual and watch videos and get a sense of what is happening under the hood. I'm gonna to try to explain that, but I think more importantly, I'm gonna to try to listen to understand why this thing is, in many people's eyes, an indispensable essential tool. Just because I have to call it out, I have a Patreon uh, and I also have affiliate links. So you wanna support the channel, keep it independent, just go to one of those places. I get a kickback from anything you buy. I think it goes to Sweetwater and obviously the Patreon is basically a tip jar. All my content is here for free on YouTube, but strong signal for me to keep going would be any new patrons, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, so I have our base on the screen here and I have it on a kick in. Okay, now with our base off, it sounds like this, soloed. Let's turn it on. That's pretty darn impressive. So let's go over the controls of this thing, introduce ourselves to the tool and try to understand how it's doing what it's doing and why it's so essential for people. So the first thing is first, there's a couple skins, light, dark. Okay, that looks kind of sexy and legacy, which is, well, legacy. I'm gonna keep it on light. You can also go over here to this little sandwich thing and go from, you know, 200% uh, all the way down to 75%. That's a little tiny for me. So we'll stay with 100. I happen to like this creamy white skin. And so we're gonna leave it at that but now you know how to change things. Presets, by the way, are down here, and then you can go and find a bunch. There's Renaissance Base Full Reset, which I love. You get a nice kind of full uh, reset of everything. Artist presets, and then some factory ones from the, the team at Waves. So starting off first with uh, left to right, what are these controls? Let's actually start from the bottom here. So if I hit Option and click, I'm gonna return things to their default state. I was playing around with this off camera, so that's why I wanna return things to the default. First off, Starting with the bottom, we have this frequency control. So this is the kind of cutoff point from which frequencies will be, I guess, reintroduced, synthesized, and then reintroduced into the signal. So it looks like we have a range of 256 to about 32 hertz. That's good for bass, isn't it? So the idea is anything above 80 hertz is going to be generated past that. And anything below 80 hertz is gonna be deleted and effectively resynthesized through some harmonic introduction somehow in some patented way. So I think the idea is you want to start with the default at around 80 and then scrub around to see if the tone and the added harmonics uh, sound better or worse to you depending on kind of where you are in this left to right uh, control here. So let's do that. That sounds a lot like the original. Let me turn it off. So it still is adding something which is impressive. A lot of action at 60. More boxy and mid-rangey at 80. Let's keep going. Okay. 
So for a kick drum, really all I'm getting is some snappy top, which isn't really what I want. So over here at 80, I think is kind of where we're in pretty good shape to leave this frequency uh, circle here, this, this parameter. It almost sounds like what it's doing is I'm going to place it on where I think the fundamental frequency is, and then it's going to reconstruct everything based on where I've put it before and after that fundamental frequency. Let's now talk about what this in and what this meter does here. So in and out, if I turn this off and I go out, I guess, I'm saying I don't want the original bass signal, in this case, my kick in, to be added into the mix of what our bass is doing. I just want its generated harmonics and that, that sound. If I go in, then I'm gonna add the original bass signal back into the mix and back into the special sauce that our bass is providing for me. So the original bass meter indicates how much original bass is in the input signal below this frequency cutoff that we have here. So they just say that basically the higher the frequency setting, the more the original bass is going to show up in this meter. Okay, I see that there's more in the meter as I go higher in the frequency. And almost none when we go all the way down. Okay, interesting. Okay, now here's where it gets interesting. The intensity meter is where we can add harmonics that are generated by our bass. The more we push it up, the more we have, uh, so it's you know uh, plus or minus 24 here, the more harmonics are introduced into the signal. And the more we push it down, it's almost like a, a wet dry perhaps. What I'm gonna do is bring Insight 2 on the screen here so that you guys can see in real time those uh, generated harmonics, uh, you know, play at a metering level. Spectrum, I'll go over here and we'll add this and make it 2D because I think 2D is a little better visually and we'll get it at a grayscale and make it RX, not ozone, RX, there we go. So here's my spectrogram, zero to 20,000 hertz from the top to the bottom. Let's watch as harmonics above, I guess the fundamental, which could be somewhere about 80 hertz get introduced in and around 80 hertz and above, bring the intensity all the way down. So I'm not seeing a ton of harmonics being added over top here, which makes sense. This is a transient element. This is a kick. So it's not like I'm going to see a ton of rich stuff from like, you know, 250 all the way to 2K. But we are seeing a lot more action. I paused it here in um, this territory from like zero to about 400 hertz, where it gets really interesting. I guess those are the extra harmonics that are being added in, getting louder as I bring the intensity up. Um, so I guess the idea here is to, you know, get the frequency right and then play with the intensity not so much so that it just adds level and you're like, I like it because it sounds better, but try to find that right level of generated harmonics that sounds good based on the sound source and where it's, you know, hanging out in the mix and the job that it has. So let's see what that sounds like before and after. The difference is pretty darn dramatic. It's almost like I've sample replaced this, as I said before. I'm gonna dial the intensity in so it's not too kind of boomy and honky. Before. Nice. So almost like a subharmonic generator without me having to do very much to get that overtone. And we have some metering here in the intensity control. And this is meant to indicate the intensity of the harmonic generation. So you'll see if I bring this all the way down, that kind of red orangey meter isn't doing anything. And if I bring it up, 
you know, the metering tells us that we're adding more and it's getting more intense. So no jumping up at the meter there. There it is. Bring it up more. Cool. I like it at around minus three, I think. So finally, we have our last slider over here, which is gain and output. So what we can do is if we want to AB match this volume wise and not get fooled into thinking it just sounds great because it's loud, we can go over here and bring this down a little bit and we have some output metering as well to let us know where we are, I guess, numerically. So let me do some before and afters and see if I can determine the before level and then the after level and match them in our base so that we have a nice comparison and can know exactly what this tool is doing. Looks like we hit it about minus 21 there. Bring it down. Okay, minus 21. Okay, so I've used Insight, specifically the momentary uh, meter over here in the loudness module to level match myself. There's some plugins that do this for you automatically, but it's always good to get into the habit of like doing this by ear and by eye. So here's before. Uh, any R base and after at a pretty good level match, I think. Quick and dirty, but pretty good. Okay, so that was R base on a kick track. Let's go and try it on an actual bass guitar. I happen to have a DI, a bass DI here, which is a great candidate for our bass because DIs are known to be especially stale and crusty and boring, which is why we, you know, we add our own after or we find the amp and try to match it. So this is going to be, I think, a good test of the capabilities here. So what I'll do is I'll go to the default full Renaissance bass reset. Here's that bass soloed without Renaissance. So not a bad sounding bass, sounds pretty pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do is bring our bass in and at its very default setting here, let's take a look at the meters. I have this running at infinite, so it is completely slowed down, almost frozen, so we can see the changes in time in the spectrum here, as opposed to having it at like a three or four or five second refresh. So before. So much more round, much more full. Um, it's actually very impressive and a lot more action. I'm not sure if you're looking at this in about uh, 55 to about 180 hertz. That's where things really started to poke up. Let me play around with the frequency to see if we get a sound that's a bit more interesting. Maybe 80 is where it should be. I always tend to leave things at the default because I know sound designers who work on the parameters and tech specs for these. You know, we'll do a lot of testing and just go, that's where it sounds good for anyone that just opens the plugin up and goes, whoa, this sounds awesome. But let's scrub around. Yeah, so in higher frequency territory, it really doesn't, you know, it, it, it's not very becoming of our bass. It doesn't sound great up there. So I think 80 to about 100 hertz is kind of where the, where the magic happens. There, that sounds great. Before. Yeah. This is really cool. Uh, let's do a level match with the gain again. I'm going to keep my eye on momentary. Uh, 
minus 23. Okay. Interesting. I had to go pretty far down on the output meter to get a level match, but I think we got within the ballpark and could make some pretty objective uh, conclusions about what exactly our base is adding in and out. I want to do one more example here on something that's a little bit more, you know, full frequency, not just a bass track. Because one of the things I read in the manual is that there are use cases for this tool within a mastering context, which obviously is not just a solo bass instrument. So. Here we have analog drum machine. What I'm going to do is call up our bass here in dual mono. And just so you know what it sounds like, the uh, original track sounds something like this. So let's add it in. Turn it off. Let's try a couple of presets here. Uh, let's say small speaker prep. Not hearing a ton of difference there. Let's go for something a little bit more big bottoms. Let's see what happens with that. So we're going lower on frequency. We're up from zero on the intensity before and after, starting with before. So I guess overall, what I think this thing is doing is, is really doing subharmonic generation, but also I guess generations above the subsonic frequency kind of area from like zero to maybe 40, 50, 60. There's stuff that's happening over that as well, depending on, I guess, where you put your frequency cutoff here. I think I'm getting it, why this thing is so beloved and why people are obsessed with it, because it is at a user experience level, extremely easy to just plunk on a track, turn on, and then keep moving. It reminds me a little bit of Little Lab's VOG. There's also a tool called Low Ender, uh, Sub Synth, I think, by Brainworks Audio. All kind of do this thing, but I think our bass is is definitely one of the easier ones that I've used. And perhaps that's the reason why people continue to gravitate to this and get really scared when they are thinking about abandoning Waves Audio, <laughs> uh, because it's going to be hard to find something quite like our bass. I'm curious what you think about this. I did the best I could to explain it, but obviously, like I said, patented stuff, they want to be careful about how they articulate the inner workings. Did you like what you heard? Were you impressed by it? Were you surprised? Were you underwhelmed? Um, let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I really want to know what the next video in the series should be. I have a couple of ideas for tools that I consider to be uh, beloved or hyped, but my you know interpretation of that is a little bit different. The RC20 video that I did didn't get that many views, so maybe it isn't as beloved as I expected it would be. So let me know if there's some tools out there that you love or you know are beloved, and then I will go in and, and do one of these videos. But thanks very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.